Thank you so much for joining me for this brief media law chat. Brooks, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, who you are and where you're from? Sure. Uh, my name is Brooks Fuller. I'm a professor, uh, assistant professor of journalism and the director of the North Carolina Open Government Coalition at Elon University in North Carolina. I'm a North Carolina native, born and bred there, and so that's that's where I am. Way to represent that school pride. Love the sweatshirt. I maybe we'll be wearing badger red in future in future chats. I'll have to I'll have to love, tee up some of that. Badgers. Yeah, yeah, love, love those the badgers. badgers. They would have won. They would have won March Madness. It was just it was our it was our time. But anyway, in our hearts, they're always the winners. Always next year. Yeah, yes, there's always next year. Well, we'll see what happens. Um, okay, so in this crazy time, we're just spending uh, some time doing a few media law chats about um, cases that people think are fantastic that everybody should know about. Maybe you don't agree with the outcome, maybe you do, but what are some interesting things? So today we're teeing up Brandenburg versus Ohio, um, which I, I always point out to students as one of those cases where it's a super important precedent, but not the kind of person you want to defend. <laughs> so That's right. so the for, First Amendment case law is littered with horrible people, and Brandenburg would be one of them, right? Um, so tell me why you picked this case. Why, why is this case so important, do you think? This case is important because what it did was it set this landmark precedent for a legal doctrine called incitement that you've heard about, usually spoken in the same breath of threats and fighting words and hate speech and things like that. And so the Brandenburg standard sets this set of rules for when speech crosses the line from being protected political or rhetorical hyperbole and unprotected incitement, which is the urging of unlawful activity by somebody else. So I've always found this to be a really fascinating uh, concept, a really fascinating landmark case, because it's completely unlike cases involving threats mm -hmm. that are about putting people in fear. It's completely unlike fighting words that are about causing really like immediate face-to-face -face breaches of between speaker and listener. And it's all about how far the government can go to punish speech because of the likelihood that it will cause some other illegal activity mm -hmm. later on in the future. And since that case, and especially now in a digital world, we've had to really rethink what it means to incite illegal activity mm -hmm. at some later point in the future. So it's just a fascinating case because it sets these standards that have been with us for decades, but are, we're having a really hard time applying them in digital network space. Right. And that's why I really was fascinated to talk with you about this, because, you know, we're talking about a 1969 um, communications environment when uh, when Brandenburg came down. That is nowhere near the world we're living in today. So what do you think are the implications with that precedent, which still stands? Uh, what are the implications for that today? Um, well, I think we need to think a little bit about how courts have applied Brandenburg over the last couple of decades to get a sense of what the implications are. And one really interesting thing that I've seen in the cases that cite to Brandenburg is there's sometimes a dispute over whether judges in a case want to treat it as a threats case or as an incitement case. So right off the bat, judges really struggle with whether to look at as if the case really implicates an incitement standard or a threat standard. Mm -hmm. So already it creates these massive divergences among judges about what playing field you ought to be even playing. I mean, what sport are you even playing mm -hmm. when, you, when you take a case? And a really famous example of this is one involving um, a Planned Parenthood affiliate out of the Pacific Northwest. It's called Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood versus ACLA. That's the American Coalition of Life Activists. Mm -hmm. And they're a kind of a, an, an extreme far-right, anti-abortion, pro-life group that advocated for violence against abortion providers as a political message. And that case gets decided as a threats case. They, they put these uh, kind of explicit warning posters up on the internet that put doctors and uh, abortion providing physicians and clinic workers in pretty legitimate fear. Mm -hmm. And if the court looks at that as a true threats case, it comes to one conclusion, but a lot of the dissenters in that case wanted to look at it as an incitement case. And I think the case would have come out completely different. So already one of the big challenges that we have to deal with is what set of rules are going to apply in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty key part of the, of the doctrine and the implications that come from it right off the bat. The, the, probably bigger and more 
uh, more serious concern right now is how do you apply a set of rules about imminent lawless action in vast global network spaces where people are constantly shouting out into networks, pleading for bad things to happen or for um, violence to be levied upon some group or some individual? Can you punish a speaker consistent with the First Amendment in those circumstances? And I think courts are just not sure what to do. Yeah, and one of the things we really struggle with um, is this idea of, you know, does, does government have the means to intervene before the incitement has incited, <laughs> before it has resulted um, in violence? And I think that's one of the things that you really do struggle with in the digital context is, you know, well, if there's meaningful time for government to intervene, are there meaningful means for government to know that the incitement has taken place, right? And it's a real struggle. I'm, I'm interested to hear you say, um, say that courts struggle with this idea of is it incitement or is it true threats? Because that is always the panic moment of teaching Brandenburg, right? You're in front of the class and they're like, well, what's the difference <laughs> between a true threat and an incitement? So uh, and, and you're, you're always kind of like, well, it's good to know that it's not just me, it's judges as well. So how do you, how do you um, set that up for people? Like if, you know, if you're at a cocktail party, just sharing the difference between a true threat and incitement, how do you sum that up? Not that that's what you talk about at cocktail parties. Maybe it's when all of us media law geeks get together, but, but how do you sum it up? Yeah, we, I think we actually do talk about that at cocktail parties quite a bit, because I did my dissertation on, a, um, on uh, an, an abortion clinic in the Southeast, like mm -hmm. doing interviews with people who protest and sometimes use violent language to protest using political messages. So yeah, it does actually come up in everyday conversation, but how I tee it up in distinguishing between the three main harmful speech doctrines of true threats, fighting words, and incitement is to think about the harms at the basis of them. Mm -hmm. uh, threats, threats, the whole doctrine about punishing threats is about punishing statements that put people in fear. So the harm is psychological and emotional damage that happens to someone when they are put in fear for their body, mm -hmm. in fear for their safety. Um, fighting words are about the harm that takes place when two people in a face-to-face -face altercation create a, a breach of the peace because of something that's said. So basically like the, the idea that something you might say to someone will cause them to immediately fight back response. And, and we've talked in my classes about how society has changed a lot and the classic case on fighting words Chaplinsky and these words like goddamn racketeer oh I did it <laughs> the case, the yeah. the case. Um, you know but that word you know GD racketeer and damned fascist like these are words that now might not cause they're tame blood right blood. They're, they're pretty tame by comparison to some other things right so you know but, but that's how I tee up those two and then when I talk about incitement it, I try to make sure to emphasize that the harm in incitement cases doesn't have to do with the harm between the speaker and the listener. It's about the harm that the listener is going to do to some other interest or some other person or some other problem. Mm -hmm. So it's all about speech that causes that listener to go out and do something else. And that's actually what makes the incitement doctrine so challenging because there's always, and I talk about this in my classes a lot, there's always a moment where the listener, it may be just a touch of a moment, but a moment where someone can deliberate and decide whether or not to act. Mm -hmm. you know, whether or not you've got you've got all the people there surrounded in the, you know, in the the field with the pitchforks and the torches and everything, and, and there's always a moment where the person with the torch can decide not to set that torch onto a building and, and burn it down. And so the incitement doctrine is really hard to square with personal autonomy. Mm -hmm. and it, can be a really, it can be a really challenging doctrine to apply and hold a speaker responsible, quite literally, for the harms caused by somebody else's physical act. I think it's it's something that I, I've noticed this change in my classes over the last couple of years um, from, you know, maybe teaching this stuff 10 or 20 years ago, um, that almost... In, almost without fail every time I talk about these sorts of things, Chaplinsky or Brandenburg. Sorry, I, I know we were focusing on Brandenburg, but I'm bringing in some other cases on you. But 
every single time I bring it up, we we seem to come back to hate speech as the example. And, you know, Charlottesville, like, why, why should we not make speakers pay for doing what they're doing? And why, can, you know, why isn't hate speech fighting words? So when I say, you know, there are these... There are these categories of speech that receive no First Amendment protection. Um, child pornography, obscenity, they're outside the bounds of that protection. And I say, fighting words. And they go, ding, 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 that's hate speech. So that should be outside the bounds of First Amendment protection. And it's something that is so just widely misunderstood. It's, I think it's an interesting social moment that that's something that, that this generation is so focused on. Um, but why isn't it? Why do, we, why do we not shut down hate speech as fighting words? I think the answer to that question lies in probably a, a really problematic opinion in RAV versus St. Paul. <laughs> that's another case that we've talked about in my classes and you've probably talked about before where the court is dealing with an ordinance drafted by uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, trying to trying to do the really important and really good work of protecting ideological expression while uh, while addressing a really serious type of speech like cross burning or the depiction of Nazi swastikas that can cause they can cause that same sort of fear or uh, social upheaval that threats typically cause. Mm -hmm. And what that case teaches us, though, is that the courts are going to be really skeptical of any attempt, any attempt by the government to decide which types of ideas are the bad types of ideas and which types are the good types of ideas. Even, even if we've got a pretty long anecdotal history, and Clarence Thomas has written about this in cross-burning cases before, a pretty long and anecdotal and now kind of intuitive history in our country of knowing that when there's a cross burned in somebody's yard, violence is likely to follow. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the challenges though for the courts is saying, well, they're challenged by line drawing as well. And courts are having a really difficult time with deciding where the line is between ideolo ideology and action. And, and it makes for just a really messy set of doctrines. So where is the line? I mean, ultimately, it's wherever the court says it is. Right. But the court has also been reluctant to take those kinds of cases, at least in recent decades. There just haven't been very many cases. I think the court probably learned a little bit of what happened from the very fractured opinion in RAV versus St. Paul, that, that cross-burning Nazi swastika case that basically involves hate speech. Mm -hmm. and. They, they had such a fractured like four three three with a bunch of concurrences going all this all this direction and the the justices were joining in part dissenting and occurring in, in part and basically it showed us that the nine they can't figure out a a simple elegant uh definition mm -hmm. or application that's going to safeguard ideology while also um also addressing speech that might cause violence yeah the other thing is I think that courts are just more willing to say, let's just rely on th the threats doctrine. And that way we can, we can draw causal links with actual threatening language. Right. Um, and something that's a little bit easier to put your, your hands on to show the harm. Whereas with hate speech, the harm is a lot more systemic. The harm is a lot more um, deep seated in creating attitudes and bigotry and things like that. And so those harms are so, uh, kind of murky and downstream that it's really challenging for courts to say that they can articulate it with enough certainty to make it a First Amendment doctrine. Right. And it, so murky and downstream, but also I, I, I really value the use of the word systemic because I think, you know, when people point to this as being such a thorny problem, the important thing that they point to is the vastness of the of the impact. So when you're talking about threats, um, you're talking about harms to a very small number or perhaps even only one person. When we're talking about hate speech, the, the impact is so vast that I think people who want a solution or want some sort of action can't understand why, when you can demonstrate this vast harm, we don't have some kind of 
some kind of response to it. And I think you're right that the RAV decision was a centerpiece of my master's thesis. And uh, <laughs> simple would never be a word you could use to describe that or elegant. It's not an elegant decision at all. It's a, you know, kind of like a, it's like a Prezi presentation, everybody buzzing all over different, different parts of the opinion. So um, one last question. Do you see Brandenburg coming back up soon? Do you think do you think that we are in an age where we're going where the court would take a case to tackle incitement? Um, particularly, maybe there's some kind of digital case that would would rise, or do you think that you know what are we forty years in fifty? Wait, uh, Katie, do your math. Forty years in? <laughs> no, fifty. No, fifty. We're 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 coming up on. We just passed fifty. Just passed fifty. Yes. Whoa. Boy, that makes me feel old. But um, I mean, I wasn't, I, I was not reading Supreme Court decisions in 1969. I'm not that old, right? Um, but coming up on a 50th anniversary, is this a pretty rock solid uh, precedent that we're not going to see shift? Yeah, I think we saw in the Alanis case, which is a famous, what we thought was maybe a revisitation of the true threats doctrine in the digital age. Mm -hmm. And we saw the court not deal with the underlying aspects of the doctrine or the contextual aspects of how threats are different on online spaces. So I would imagine that if a case went up that had to do with the incitement doctrine, you would not see any tinkering, no pun intended there at all, <laughs> but uh, you wouldn't see any any sort of um, revisitation of Brandenburg. I think Alana's kind of showed us that. One thing to remember historically is that Brandenburg and Watts are decided essentially in back-to-back -back terms with a one justice difference i think mm -hmm. it's um I, I had to blank now i was going to say frankfurter but but that may be wrong one justice did not participate in the brandenburg decision that participated in the watts decision so you've got these two twin cases coming up essentially right at the same time and one we know that the court hasn't read this, the basic scaffolding of it or the meat of it i don't think they do it with the other either yeah um, and instead they'd probably be happy to let the the laboratories of the lower courts do the work and what we're seeing is that that's very fact specific very case by case pretty fractured depending on things kind of like where our talk started off mm -hmm. absolutely all right well brooks thank you so much for doing this it was great to chat with you and uh, i know students will benefit from it and i'll i'll share it with my kids but i'll also share it uh, far and wide so uh, best of luck continuing your work as we all do these things remotely from here on out. And uh, I hope to connect with you in person at some point, at <laughs> um, uh, some point, maybe this summer. So, all right, thanks so much, Brooks. Have a great day. Badgers, go Phoenix. <laughs> all right, bye-bye. See ya.